I realized that I got the date wrong today. It's actually the 21st, but that's all right. It's close enough. All right, so what is WebAssembly? Who has not heard of WebAssembly in this room before? Nobody has not heard of it. Awesome. Um, I will just briefly state what I think it is. I, it's a portable low-level bytecode. So that means that you compile programs to it. It's not something that you write by hand, although I've written, written a lot of it by hand. It runs on a software virtual machine. There is no hardware out there that runs WebAssembly natively, but maybe soon, uh, various research projects in the work in the works, but this is typically a thing that you run through a software layer, which is good. It was originally uh, launched for the web. That was back in 2017 when it first became uh, available in browsers, and now it's being used in many domains, so many different domains that I won't list them all. This is my quote. I had to come up with a vision for this to, to kind of frame this talk. Who here has heard of Unicode before? Okay, everybody uses Unicode. It's the one standard for text that we have. Before Unicode, there were so many different standards, it was terrible. Like, now there's actually one. Unicode's not perfect. Unicode is the union of all the things. Maybe that's not quite what we want for WebAssembly, but I'm going in this general direction thinking, maybe WebAssembly will be the binary format for all compiled code in the future. So, it will not be perfect, but it'll be the, the final standard where we can move beyond having machine code at the bottom of software. So just a little bit of my background. So at the very, when I first started programming, I thought I want to design my own programming language. That was the first thing that I wanted to do. And ever since then, I've kind of been working at that from different angles. Um, when I learned Java in 98, I immediately wanted to figure out how does this Java thing work? And that's how I got into Java virtual machines. So when I started uh, college, that was 98. Uh, I almost, almost immediately thereafter started working on JVMs. There was a project at, at Purdue called OpenVM. And that was an idea to implement Java inside of Java itself. And that was actually got me really interested in both languages and how they work inside. I worked at Sun, uh, both as an intern and later as an employee after grad school. I worked a little bit with Hotspot. I didn't, I didn't do a whole lot with Hotspot. Um, but then when I was in grad school, I did actually get a chance to design my own programming language. And I still work on it. And in fact, Wizard, which I'm gonna talk about today, is written in Virgil. So Virgil is a language that's actually 20 years old. Um, I wrote an AVR emulator that's also kind of like a little VM, too. And, I, and there's some ideas from Evrora uh, that I'm going to use in this talk, too. But after I graduated school, I went to work at Sun, and I worked on this thing called Maxine. Again, a Java and Java VM. It turns out that Java is not the best language for writing VMs. And I, I think Virgil's a better language for writing VMs, which is why I'm using it for, for Wizard uh, these days. After I worked at Sun, I worked at Google, I worked on V8 for seven years. I primarily worked on the optimizing JIT compiler. So I am not responsible for JavaScript language design issues. I mostly don't even <laughs> know anything about JavaScript, mostly only wrote JavaScript in order to write WebAssembly tests. Uh, but I did try to make it fast. And Turbofan, the optimizing JIT in V8, is also the thing that makes WebAssembly fast too. So they're like kind of unified, at least at the back end architecture. Uh, and since that time, so I, I worked on the WebAssembly VM uh, pretty much from the beginning, and now I decided, actually, I want to do research again. I want to work on what, is, what, what does it look like 20 years out? What do VMs look like architecture-wise 20 years out? And so that's what Wizard is about. And that's pretty much the most relevant part here is this part here. Why do we build research VMs? So it turns out that students don't know anything. And we have to teach them, and we need artifacts to teach them. So we want them to become virtual machine experts, and they can get there. And so they need, an art, need to have a vehicle to do that. And it needs to be simpler than V8. V8 is 900,000 lines of code. It's written in C++. It's very intricate. That's not going to be something that a student can be thrown in the deep end, and, they, and they're going to be able to do that. They need something simpler. And also, when we were talking about virtual machines, we need to pretend like we actually know the, the good things about VMs and the bad things. So we want to compare and contrast them. So when you have a research vehicle, you can look at the simple sort of textbook implementation, and you can look at a production implementation, and you can compare and contrast them. And we can pretend like this is engineering as opposed to just making stuff up. So when we do research, we're talking about what do, what do VMs look like? VMs are under stress from various different language features and various different forces. So there's going to be new techniques that we want to employ to make them better and faster. So you want a research vehicle to do that. You want to have something that's flexible. 
We also maybe want to look at programs and how they behave, in particular benchmarks. So that means dynamically analyzing them. It's nice to have an artifact that can not only run a program, but also can tell you something interesting about the execution. You can get some insight into the execution. And of course, developing new languages too. Languages need to have an implementation. It's better if you have a vehicle that helps give you some feedback about whether the implementation is correct or not. Again, V8 is very fast, but it doesn't really like it when your programs have bugs. It likes to just crash your program and tell you that your program's bad. That's not good feedback for a language designer because you're gonna have crashing programs a lot. You actually wanna see some insight and be able to debug your compiler. And of course, WebAssembly is evolving too. So if we add extensions, are we going to do that in production VMs or are we gonna do that in research uh, vehicles? And of course, a research engine can help steer language evolution too. Not only of WebAssembly, but also of languages. The easier it is to experiment with a feature, either in terms of a WASM feature or a source level feature, the easier it is to try out many different ideas and know which is good. And the other thing is actually, I think this can work well in synergy with production VMs by taking pressure off them to support this use case. A research VM is designed to be flexible. You're supposed to try out lots of new ideas. You can't really do that in a production VM unless it's been designed for that. And a production VM can't really serve two masters of being both flexible and also being highly performant. So this actually should work together. They should work together. So there's a good example of this. So anybody heard of Jikes RVM before? There's a, there's a handful of hands. So Jikes RVM was a research system. It still exists. Uh, their byline was, it provides a flexible open test bed to prototype virtual machine technologies and experiment with a large variety of design alternatives. This was a highly successful research project. It originally started in IBM research and then got picked up by academia, and their idea was to implement a Java VM that people, particularly grad students, could do things with. And that was borne out in that almost 200 publications came out of that and at least 36 PhDs. So I don't know if Wizard is gonna quite achieve that level of fame in the research community, but that's kind of what I've got in the back of my head. We need a vehicle like that for WebAssembly. So what is Wizard? Wizard is a research engine designed for flexibility and experimentation. That's gonna be the highest priority. There's already a little bit of research coming out, so I, I published a paper uh, last year in Uppsala about the interpreter design. WebAssembly is typically compiled to machine code, and nobody thought it was really even possible to interpret it directly, and that's what that paper is about. I'll only briefly touch on that. It's not really the point of this talk. This is more of an overview talk. What is in this talk is I'm gonna talk about instrumentation, the hooks and the API, because getting that insight into the dynamic execution of programs and the VM itself is actually the important thing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the baseline compiler, which is how Wizard competes with production VMs and being fast. What I'm not gonna talk about, which are also cool things, uh, it implements several of the extensions that have been proposed for WebAssembly, so things like garbage collection, exception handling, uh, memory, multiple memory, and things like that. Um, I am not gonna talk about exploring extensions to uh, support new languages on WebAssembly, although that's also an interesting thing that I'm interested in. Uh, and I'm also not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the language that it's implemented in, although I would love to. I spent 20 years working on Virgil. I'd love to spend a whole hour talking about it, but I won't. There are talks on YouTube, there are papers that you can pretend to read and also not cite if you're interested in that. <laughs> okay, so what are the priorities? You actually have to write these down. I think if you're starting a software system and you don't know what the requirements are and you don't know what the priorities are, you'll probably end up with something that maybe isn't, doesn't meet the needs of what you started out with. These are the priorities I came up with and this is the order that I came up with. Number one at the top, observability. We wanna see what happens at runtime. It's great to go fast, but we actually want to see what happened because things crash, things have weird behaviors, and this is a research setting, so we wanna look at all of that. The other thing is, is that Wizard hopefully will be used by students. It should be approachable. It should be code that's not terrifying like C++ is in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so it should be something where you can read the code, you can read documentation, you can read the design, and you can get into it quite easily. I'll talk about later about how we measure that. I have no idea how to measure that. Um, we'll see. It needs to be competitive in terms of performance. It doesn't have to be top tier performance. So it's not gonna be as fast as a production engine like V8. But it has to be close enough 
so that if you have a research result in the research engine, you can at least see how it might transfer. So you can kind of eyeball things. You have to be in the same ballpark. And then last but not least, it needs to be flexible and extensible, because that's what students are gonna, gonna work on. They're gonna try something out, and so they wanna be able to do that inside of Wizard. Okay, contrast with that with V8. Uh, there's only one priority. Uh, maybe, maybe not quite true, but really ultimate performance, that is the top priority. And in making this talk, I really racked my brain to think about what are the other priorities for V8 and for an engineering team. And I, they're way down there, but it's that. <laughs> V8 is a complicated system. There's uh, you know, dozens of people working on it. It has to support new language features, and its internal complexity is to the point where it is really beyond human comprehension, at least beyond a single person's comprehension. And so it's really designed, all those other things are, are kind of filtering up to that the engineering team really can support it and evolve it for the future. And these other things, observability, they're kind of under there maybe, uh, but they're really uh, serving that goal of, of ma making it a, a system that's maintainable and sustainable. So what does observability mean? So in particular, WebAssembly being a code format, it goes into this software virtual machine. And so those things that happen when you take a, the format and, and turn it into an internal representation, so parsing the code, decoding the code, and actually validating the type system of WebAssembly, those are all things that you may actually want to make observable. In particular, if you're a language designer, you've written a compiler and you're generating WebAssembly, which is a binary format, and you'll probably get it wrong. And so you want the engine to tell you exactly what went wrong and where. So the observability basically boils down to having nice tracing modes, having nice output, and telling you if you have a type error, kind of making a nice error message so you can figure out what's wrong with your compiler. Again, this is more targeted towards people who are potentially generating WebAssembly code that's broken. And so those good error messages really, really matter. And then the other parts of observability are, of course, the execution of the program. What happens when you execute the program? The engine itself is doing things, like it's doing those activities, like loading code and, and parsing and validating the code, but it also may be compiling functions, it may be allocating memories and things like that. You may wanna analyze the, anal the engine's performance, it may be just generally get a picture of what's going on. That's also instructive to understand what the engine is doing with your code when you give it to it, because you, potentially being a language implementer, uh, may be optimizing your compiler, so you wanna get an idea of what's going on. You can't optimize something you can't see or measure. And then of course, if you're maybe not a language implementer or designer, you may be studying benchmarks or programs or other things, you wanna see what those programs do. Are they running in a hot loop? Are they allocating a lot of memory? Is it jumping between lots of different functions? What's going on? You know, if you run a benchmark and you get a number like it's three seconds long, it's not a whole lot of information. You instead wanna see into that execution, what's there. And then of course, it turns out that programs have bugs. And I have tried many years to stop doing that, but it keeps <laughs> happening. <laughs> so I have made mistakes in writing the engine, and I have found that for my own uh, velocity, being able to debug the code that I wrote in the engine, and by extension, students who may add extensions to the engine will also have to debug their code. So we wanna be able to debug the engine itself, but also debug user programs too, because again, compiler writers are gonna generate code that may be wrong, maybe it gets through the validator, maybe it doesn't, but it's gonna crash, so we wanna get some insight there. So that's all part of this observability goal. Okay, so how does this actually break down? So we're gonna do some dynamic analysis, so don't be afraid of those words, it just means looking at programs running. The insights that I came away uh, with from doing a bit of uh, exploration into the kinds of things that you want to look at is that actually, most dynamic program analyses actually are tied to very specific locations in a program. So the API that you come up with actually makes sense to think of how are we gonna add instrumentation to a program, it's probably gonna be tied to locations in the program. Sometimes it's tied to specific data in a program, but usually we can also get to that by instrumenting particular locations. But other than that, it's typically very sparse in time, so you know, you might have a program and it executes three billion instructions. Clearly you're not going to just dump out a log of three billion instructions and sort through that with grep or something like that. So it's actually very sparse. So you wanna have instrumentation that's targeted to very specific things that a program might do. 
But other than that, the commonalities start to break down. You really have lots of different things that you might want to look at when a program is executing. Different events you might want to look at, different ways of analyzing the events. So ultimately is crying out for some kind of programmability in terms of uh, the instrumentation and observability. So just examples to kind of paint the picture here. What if I want to see the parts of the program that have been executed versus not? That's called code coverage. That's a clear example of something where you want to add some instrumentation to the program to record that. Maybe I'm interested in which branches in their program are very unpredictable. Maybe I'm working on research that's a branch predictor or something like that. So profiling the branches, or maybe a compiler optimization tor targeted towards branches. Or maybe I'm interested in the memory system, or maybe I'm interested in understanding a bit more about the program and I want to see what functions call what, so construct a dynamic call graph. If you want to build a debugger, you want breakpoints, right? You want to stop at a particular location in the program and then look at the program state. Or maybe even better, actually stop when a particular memory location is accessed. That's one of the great things about a debugger is that where is this thing getting overwritten? So you want watch points and also tracing to all those things. And then going beyond that, you know, you can think of more advanced use cases like maybe I want to fuzz a program or inject a fault and study things at that level. So there's kind of climbing a hierarchy here. So this all boils down to one thing in wizard, it's callbacks. This is not really like rocket science, it's just callbacks. So I'll give you an idea. So I mentioned that wizard has an interpreter for WebAssembly. So this is a block of WebAssembly code over here. Obviously this is text, but it's gonna work on the binary format. But if we think about this little program here, this WebAssembly program, there's maybe some point that's interesting to us as, a, as an analyzer of this uh, program. And what we really want is to add some logic, which is just a callback that happens whenever this point is executed. And whatever we want to see about the program, we can package that up behind an interface called the frame accessor. And the frame accessor basically gives this user callback a view of the state of the executing WASM program. Whether that's the actual memory that the program is using, uh, the execution stack, including all the functions that are on the execution stack, and all the values that the program is manipulating. Having this one pinch point in the API means that the engine knows every time that this callback is accessing the program state. And so the engine is actually gonna be able to optimize against that interface. Okay, so there's this, there's a couple of different ways of doing that. So one way is that you can add a probe to the interpreter loop itself. So you get a callback for every single bytecode that's executed. This is like the shotgun approach to doing program analysis. It's not super sparse and it's not gonna be super efficient, but Wizard has a way to do that for like quick and dirty analyses, like tracing every bytecode. And it's implemented efficiently. And so there's a trick that I use here that I'll explain. Um, so this is the interpreter's state. The red things are the interpreter's state. So there's a IP, which is the instruction pointer, where the interpreter keeps track of the current executing bytecode. So wherever we are in the actual machine, uh, sorry, the web, web assembly code, uh, there's a pointer to the end of the code too. But also there is some table that tells the interpreter what to do for every kind of bytecode. And that's called a dispatch table. And so the idea here is that dispatch table is not a fixed thing but instead there's a register that points to that dispatch table, which normally points to a dispatch table, the blue one, that points to the actual machine code for what to do for every single different kind of opcode. And the idea is that if you have a global probe where you want a callback for every single bytecode, we just swap the register. And the register now points to a different table. And that table, every entry in that table actually just goes to another instrumented version that calls the user callback. And the idea being that when you switch on this instrumentation, we only have to switch one register. If we want to switch it off, we can switch the register back. And because there's no overhead for the normal path, we're always just using this dispatch table, which is the normal one if things aren't turned on. It means that we don't need to have a debugging mode for our interpreter, for our, for our VM. You don't need to build wizard in a special way to get this, it's always there. And it imposes no overhead on the quote unquote production performance. And so this is a key thing, which is a good ergonomics thing, is that those, that instrumentation capability is always there with no overhead. Okay, obviously doing a callback for every bytecode, it sounds lame, it's not gonna be fast, it isn't fast. Even with that trick, it's not fast. That's probably not what you want to do. And in particular, again, usually a program, there are specific points of interest where you want to get some insight. 
So in this one, yeah. Ah, so you mean bytecode in terms of bytecode class or bytecode themselves? Yeah. So this one would be literally every single bytecode regardless of its opcode class. But I do have a trick that will do it per opcode class too. And if you think about it, it's like if you just modify the, uh, sorry, if you just modify the dispatch table entry for a particular class of opcode, yeah. But no, this is every dynamically executed bytecode. Excellent question, thank you. Okay, so local probes are the idea that, yes, it's sparse in space and time. There are only specific places in the program that we want to instrument, and so we know them at some point, so let's call in particular. And the idea is that we can make the interpreter also support this by making a copy of the code and overriding that byte code. So I chose this very ugly pink color on purpose. So the interpreter is going to run through and is executing byte codes, it's going through that dispatch table. When it hits this probe opcode, there's gonna be an entry. Oh, this means this, this instruction itself has been instrumented. And we can keep a copy of the original code so that we only have to make one modification and the idea is that when the interpreter hits this opcode, then it calls the user callback. And since we've got a copy of the original code and we've only modified the thing at the particular offset, we don't actually have to insert any particular, we don't have to insert bytecode, we actually know where we were. And knowing where we were to tell the user program we reached this place is actually very useful. So it turns out that if you wanted to implement this by bytecode rewriting and inserting code, you have to constantly map back to what was the original offset. And that's a pain and there's bugs. It's just like way simpler to do it this way and it's actually more efficient too. So after we've called the user callback, we actually wanna execute the code that was there. And since we've got the original code, we can just load the original byte from there. And since we know the offset, that's actually very efficient. So there's no searching here. There's no like inserting byte codes and not, not knowing where the offsets are. And then we'll just execute the original code. And the great thing about that too is that we can remove them. So not only can we insert probes, but we can remove them by just taking the byte from the original code and writing it back. And so now the interpreter won't trip over the probe byte code and we go back to full speed. Okay, so I'm gonna run through an example of how we build a more complex analysis. So this is the mechanism at the bottom. So the global probe and the local probe are the mechanisms that Wizard gives you to write the more complicated analyses. So let's talk about code coverage. We're gonna use probes here, and the key thing that we just went through is that you can insert and you can also remove probes. So for code coverage, what we're going to do is we could do it by instruction, so we could pick every single instruction, or we could do it by basic block. We'll just pick basic blocks for this example. So again, we're gonna make a copy of the code, so we're gonna insert probes at the beginning of every basic block, which is here. And then we're gonna keep some state on the side, which is which of the basic blocks have we actually executed. And by inserting probes, there's gonna be all of those instructions are overwritten. And what's gonna happen is that when we actually, when the interpreter actually executes that code, it's gonna call the user callback. And that user callback, again, is any logic that we wrote. And so this logic in particular just updates the state for B1. So we're just gonna overwrite that and record that that block was executed. But the key thing is this is code coverage. We only need to do that once, so we can remove that probe. So once that probe is removed, it will never execute again, it will, have never, it will not have overhead the next time. And so as the program executes, it's gonna fire the probes as it hits them newly and update the state. And so eventually we're gonna get to a point where all the blocks in the program that have been executed have removed their instrumentation. And they've also recorded that they have been executed. And so, that means that the hot part of the program is eventually going to get compiled by a JIT compiler, for example, uh, with no overhead at all. So we sort of asymptotically approach the performance that you would have by the things removing the instrumentation uh, themselves as they go along. Most systems, you can't actually remove the, the instrumentation once it's been inserted. This is one of the reasons why you might want to support that. Okay, so there's lots of things that you can start building with this. And so I had students uh, hack on Wizard, which is part of the reason that I think that Wizard is hackable is that students were able to do this and implement lots of different things. This required no additional changes to the VM. It's just a thing that's built with probes. So in particular, 
there's this thing, in, and also they spend a lot of time making those nice terminal colors. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> so the loop monitor in particular, this one is basically, you just insert a counter at the beginning of every loop. In WebAssembly, that's a loop bytecode, so you can find them very easily. You don't even have to do any control flow analysis. You just run through, find all the loops in the, in the program, you insert a probe on them, which is a counter, and then actually most of the logic is making the nice pretty colors at the end. So there's really only like a dozen lines of code to insert the, the, uh, the probes themselves. It's similar for branch profiling. So branch profiling is a little bit more complicated because you wanna record which direction every branch went, true or false, and also for switches, like which of the switch cases you went to. And so this one actually, not only does it have a, a probe that fires at a particular location, that probe actually loads the top of the WASM stack and figures out which way the branch would go. And so it turns out to be implement, turns out to be much easier to implement it that way as opposed to implementing the targets of branches and trying to figure out where you came from. And then again, uh, nice printout at the end, but ultimately the logic is very simple. Engine doesn't know anything about it. It's just a probe that fires at a location and it can give it the top of the stack. Code coverage we saw, instruction tracing. So Wizard has lots of different modes where you can ask it, please just tell me like what's executing either this function or whatever. There's nothing custom in the VM for that. It's all just implemented with probes. Um, you can also do profiling too of the calls. And so that, that one is just implemented with probes at the beginning of a function that record what the time is and then output a nice pretty flame graph or other um, display of that. Um, the hotness monitor, I love the hotness monitor, it's hot. Uh, it just counts all the instructions in the program and then it gives you this nice display about what is hot. What is the hottest part of the program? How much of the code actually constitutes, for example, the top 90% of executed instructions? And so the instrumentation part of that's really simple. And so there's kind of a theme is that the instrumentation part is actually fairly trivial and then it's all about presentation. Uh, there's also a debugger too. The debugger uses probes to do uh, breakpoints and also watch points as well. And it allows you to, for example, see the stack, you can see the locals, you can even change the locals. So you can do like fixing continue. It is a bytecode level debugger, so it's not super awesome. So you are debugging WASM bytecode. But if, again, if you're a language designer and you're trying to debug the code that your compiler uh, has emitted, you might actually want to step through it. And so that's what that gives you. It turns out that these probe mechanisms, they're very, it's very low level. We're talking about bytecode things. We're looking at the bytecode state, we're looking at this, you know, instructions, we're not looking at source level uh, stuff. We might actually want to look at higher level things, and I, I think that what that means is that we're building a hierarchy of instrumentation capabilities. So we can build everything from global bytecode probes, those are the ones that execute every bytecode, but obviously, if we use local probes, they're more efficient because they only execute when that particular uh, instruction is executed, but they also tell the engine the intent, which is I only care about this instruction as opposed to caring about lots of things. And so the engine can optimize against the intent. And so what we started to, to build is a, a higher level API that has the kitchen sink of all the things that is implemented in terms of the low, lower level things. So in particular, like you didn't see anything for memory instrumentation here. That can be built with probes. You didn't see anything for function entry and exit. That can be built with probes. It turns out that that's tricky and I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Uh, but basically, we're building up libraries to make this much better. So I'll give you an idea why that doesn't really work to just, function entry and exit is actually really tricky. In particular, uh, you think, well, I'll just insert a probe at the beginning of a function and at the end of a function. But actually, a function it's like a nasty special case waiting for you, it could start with a loop. And so if you, your probe is gonna fire every time around this loop. And if you just put it at the end, well, maybe there's early returns in the middle. So you don't want every user who's interested in just function entry and exit to have to go and handle those special cases. So instead, what you do is you have a call stack emulation. So implemented in terms of probes, there's a nice library that will put a probe at the beginning, it will be able to tell the difference between the, lo the loop coming back around and being entered from the, fir the first time, and it will also instrument the returns, and it will also instrument any like unwinds that you have, and then the nice library calls your user callback. So you don't actually even have to see probes. So we're kind of getting into the phase where we're figuring out what's in the nice, ni nice library. Okay, observability is great. So this picture is the overhead of the branch monitor. 
So this is execution time is up, and this is relative execution time, so this is a bunch of different benchmarks. And so you want to be close to 1.0. That means no overhead, okay? And this is actually comparing two different things. So bytecode rewriting would be what you do if you do not have any support in the engine for doing instrumentation. You just rewrite the program to insert instructions. And because there's more instructions, it's gonna be uh, more overhead on the program. It turns out it's about a 2x overhead if you wanna insert the kind of instructions that you need to record branches. It's also very tedious, it's not super fun. Uh, if you use local probes and you use wizards facilities, it's kind of in the noise. It's like on the order of 10 to 20% overhead, which is great. So it, not only is it a lot more uh, ergonomic and easy to use, it's also, also lower overhead. But this is an interpreter, right? So 15% slower in an interpreter, that's not, that's not great. I mean, interpreters are a lot slower than compiled code. In fact, so Wizard does have a baseline compiler it is, you get like a 20x improvement in performance. So what does it mean in terms of relative overhead, 15% in the interpreter versus 20x? That's not a research result that you can publish. So I wouldn't want to write a paper and then have a reviewer tell, you, tell me, oh, that's great that you made the interpreter only 15% slower. What about the compiled code? So you can't really do that. So now we actually have to get into a regime where when we're talking about overheads or we're talking about mechanisms, we have to have a system which has at least competitive performance. And so that means it's JIT time. I love writing JIT compilers. It's like my seventh JIT compiler. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I build a baseline JIT for Wizard that is basically a single pass compiler that is designed to be really simple and easy to understand and hackable for students. I did even have students hack it, but also gives you good code and also supports this instrumentation. And so it, it, the fact that it supports this instrumentation means that you don't see it as a user of the VM or as a person who's hacking on the VM. You can write all of your instrumentation and the JIT compiler will just work around it. And one of the key things here that makes that work is the JIT compiler uses the same stack frame layout as the interpreter. So in particular, it's this picture which should be obvious that how awesome it is. <laughs> so at the bottom here, the blue, that's the execution stack. So that's like the native x86 execution stack. And so that grows to the left, so it uses points to by RSP. The key idea is that those stack frames there, they're the same size between the interpreter and the JIT compiled code. That means that we can flip between JIT code and the interpreter really easily so the orange-ish thing, I don't actually, maybe kind of peach, I don't even know where I came up with this color. Uh, but that's the value stack. That's where the, WASM's the WASM program's dynamic values are stored. If we also use the same layout for that, then it means that it's effectively compatible between the interpreter and the JIT compiler. So here we see, an, a on the right, right bottom here, we see a zoomed in picture of the execution frames. The things an interpreter frame has are like a pointer into the code, a pointer to the function, a pointer to the instance, you know, a pointer to where you are on the value stack and things like that. And a JIT frame has almost all the same things except it doesn't have like an instruction pointer. It may or may not actually m move the stack pointer as it's going along. But to flip between the two, you just have to go, if you're going from JIT code to the interpreter, you just have to come up with the things that aren't in the actual, aren't being maintained by the JIT code. And vice versa, it's actually pretty easy. You just need to know where to go in the machine code. So flipping back and forth between the two of them means that we can do observability. So around instrumentation, if we decide, okay, there's a probe, or we've inserted a probe in the code now, oh, that function is JIT compiled, it's very easy to go back to the interpreter. And of course, lots of systems do that. In fact, V8, says, V8 does that. It's the most complicated thing in a VM is getting that right. And so Wizard is designed so that that's, that mechanism is so simple. It's like impossible to screw that. It's not impossible, but it is very hard to screw it up and it's easy to understand how it works. So you can throw a student at it and be like, fix this thing in the OSR mechanism and they can do it. Uh, I, that's not possible with V8. V8 is actually very intricate there. So we can also go both directions, right? We can go from the interpreter to the JIT. That happens if we've got a hot loop. So Wizard has now gotten to the point where it's like other engines, it will dynamically adapt to your program's execution it will start off in the interpreter and then it will warm up to the JIT compiler. That's because we want to have faster startup 
And so that's really easy to do now with this setup of the uh, stack frame layouts. But we also go the other direction. So a lot of VMs go the other direction when they make optimizations that are speculative. Wizard doesn't do speculative optimizations. It only goes back to the interpreter if you change instrumentation. And so we'll do that transparently. So the picture is basically like this. A baseline compiler for WebAssembly is designed for fast compile speed as opposed to highest code quality. And it basically will make one pass over the code. It will use an abstract interpreter, meaning that it effectively models what's on the WebAssembly's value stack as it's generating code, and it will generate code for one instruction at a time. For compiler people, that sounds kind of lame, you know, like at one instruction at a time, the code's gonna be really bad. As it turns out, that WebAssembly, because it's a stack machine and because the control flow is structured, even doing code gen one instruction at a time, you get pretty good code because all the instructions that manipulate the stack and manipulate local variables, those mostly manipulate the abstract state and you can register it, allocate as you go along. So both V8 and SpiderMonkey, all the web engines, they have baseline compilers for WebAssembly. Wizards is very similar. Um, there, I could go into some details, but it's really not that important. But the idea is that you get code out very quickly. You don't have to backtrack. And supporting probes is actually really easy because, again, the program, uh, sorry, the instrumentation has given its intent by saying, I am interested in this part of the code, which is the ugly purple probe thing, and when the compiler gets there, it's really easy just to just insert a, a call to the runtime. For some probes, uh, for example, like maybe you just want to count how many times this particular instruction is executed, the JIT also understands that some kind of probes are special and it will generate special machine code, so two instructions. In this case, it looks like one was actually two instructions. Uh, and that's like very low overhead. So you can use counter probes and they will become super efficient uh, when they get JIT compiled. Okay, so what does that all mean in the, in the grander scheme of things? So this is a, this is a two-dimensional trade-off in performance. So on the x-axis, notice the x-axis is log, logarithmic. That's the amount of time it takes to get going to execute. So that's a processing time per code byte. So it's normalized per byte of WebAssembly code. And it turns out they're grouped very interestingly. And the scatter plot is gonna be, and the different colors are, those are different execution tiers for WASM. So that's interpreters, baseline compilers, optimizing compilers, and interpreters that rewrite the code. And the, the y-axis here, the vertical axis, that's execution time, that's normalized to running on V8, so higher is worse, lower is better. And you can see there's like very clear groupings between execution strategies for uh, WebAssembly code. All the optimizing compilers, they take effectively eons to compile a function because they build an IR and they do optimizations and they do register allocation. They're way over there to the right, but they're down at the bottom because they generate the best code. And in fact, if you were to zoom in there, basically all the optimizing compilers are about the same speed as V8 Turbofan. And then for the baseline compilers, they generate code much faster because they are the single pass design as I showed but they don't generate quite as good as code, so they kind of are a little bit higher up. Those are all the blue ones there. And then rewriting interpreters, they actually walk over the code to generate another IR to interpret, but they're interpreting that IR, and so they're much lower. Uh, Wizard, Wizard interprets the bytes directly, so it doesn't have to rewrite anything. That's why it's so much farther to the left, because the overhead of basically just validating the code, that's what that is. And so the idea here is that Wizard's JIT fits right in there, it's just like pretty much all the other baseline compilers, but you get this special power of that it supports instrumentation, just like the interpreter. So the summary is it's fast. I mean, that's, it should probably be qualified. It's not as fast as V8. It's as fast as V8's baseline compiler. Um, it's a little bit faster on some benchmarks, but these are really in the, in the same ballpark. Um, I won't really go into value tagging. I probably shouldn't have put that on the slide, but one of the things that uh, makes it possible to interpret and also compile and use the same frame layout is the way values are represented on uh, Wizard's value stack. But the key thing is, is that full instrumentation capabilities, which means that when you use Wizard and you write probes and you insert probes and even remove probes and maybe insert more probes later, it's all completely transparent. You, all, you can think of it like an interpreter 
and the JIT just kind of works in the background and, and makes your code faster. And de-optimization, in Wizard's case, again, it doesn't do any speculative optimizations. It will only de-opt to the interpreter if you change the instrumentation. So it's got predictable uh, performance. Okay. So that's all about the observability and also competitive performance to some extent. What about this approachability metric? I honestly don't really know how to measure this. It's quite subjective, but I can at least measure the simplicity in terms of lines of code. So in Wizard, uh, it takes about 18,000 lines of code to implement the engine. That includes all of the interpreter and baseline compiler and all of the validation, everything. It's all 18,000 lines of code. And I didn't really do a lot to make it like, you know, cramming things on one line. I don't, I didn't do a whole lot of that. Just in comparison, V8, just the code to parse WASM and to type check it and to make an IR for it, that's about 57,000 lines of code. That's C++ code. Um, there's like lots of includes and stuff like that. Uh, so it's a little bit bigger than it could be. But that's actually significantly more complicated. And then when you start adding execution tiers, a baseline tier, for one architecture is 17,000 lines of code. And then the optimizing compiler in V8, which I love and I spent many years working on, it's huge. It's 290,000 lines of code. So I don't think that a student is gonna be able to do anything in, in V8 uh, in the time frame of a particular, of a semester. So I think in terms of simplicity, Wizard has an advantage there. How robust is the system? So one of those things is I mentioned, programs have bugs, people make mistakes. So when the thing crashes, how do you know, what do you do? And one of the great things about Wizard is that I spent two decades designing Virgil so that you don't crash as much. It's a nice memory safe language, it's garbage collected. Um, and so you just avoid a lot of bugs. And so that means that actually that it should be a lot more robust. So you don't have the kinds of things that, that bite you uh, in another system. I didn't really talk about it here, but there's actually two interpreters inside of WASM, uh, sorry, in, in ter inside of Wizard. There's the one that I wrote in uh, assembly language to be fast, but there's also one that's just pure Virgil source code. So that uses arrays, all the things are bounds checked and stuff like that. So you can write no nice source code, and so you can really write like 10 lines of code to add a byte code to that. Uh, how self-explanatory is this system? I don't know how to measure that. Um, I think there's a lot less noise in the Virgil code that I wrote there. Um, the documentation is probably not as good as it should be, but that's something that we can work on. Okay, just to give you an idea, where's all the lines of code go? Okay, 14 lines of code. This defines all the WebAssembly values that you have in Wizard. So this is just a, this is just a Virgil syntax for writing an algebraic data type. So values can be references, they can be I31s, they can be 32 and 64 bit integers and floating point and also vectors too. And they, and they have a way to print them out. The same amount of code that does the same thing in V8 is 241 lines because C++ doesn't have ADTs so you have to write them by hand. You write a class and it has subclasses and you have a union and you have a tagging mechanism. So just throwing a student at V8, at V8 and saying, okay, add a WebAssembly value and they have to go through that code and make it work, and then they have to go find compile errors and other places where it's missing. Um, that's just a lot more work because it just takes a lot more code. And of course, like if you use another language like Rust, for example, or OCaml, then you also get this mechanism. So just having nice language mechanism means that we cut down on code. All right, and that's all I got. I think I got. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.